Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis for August 1st, 2012. I'm Father Anthony Sylvia and joining me from all the way across the internet is Bishop Thomas Langley. Bishop, hello. Hey, Father. How are you doing? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing well. Excited about uh, Cthulhu and our special guest tonight. Aren't we all excited about Cthulhu? <laughs> yeah. So speaking of our special guest, we have once again joining us our very first repeating guest, Monsignor Scott Rosbach. Hello, Monsignor. Hello, Anthony. How are you doing? I'm great. So glad to have you back with us again. Uh, I'm glad to be here. All right, and tonight we're going to be talking more about H.P. Lovecraft, specifically the mythology of H.P. Lovecraft. Uh, if you are interested in participating in our conversation, you can leave a comment on the YouTube live comments section, and we will respond to them on the air. Or if you're watching it recorded, you can just leave a comment, and we'll get back to you later. Uh, but uh, that all said, let's get right into it. Um, so we, last time we talked a little bit about... Uh, Lovecraft generally. Uh, this time we're going to talk about the mythology specifically, and we'll start off with some of the major figures in the Lovecraft mythos. Uh, why don't you run down your list here, Monsignor, and tell us a little bit about them. All right. Well, um, the first thing I really want to say about Lovecraft is that he was definitely a one of the pioneers of the open source movement, although he wouldn't have called it that. He, When he created these beings in his uh, fiction, he allowed other writers to use them. So the, the Lovecraftian mythos is huge. I mean, there is just an innumerable number of gods. But I'm going to focus on the ones that he himself worked with. Um, other people have mentioned these. Uh, Ramsey Campbell, August Derleth, uh, these authors have also used these creatures or these entities as, their, uh, as members of their story, characters in their story. But uh, these are the ones that Lovecraft really focused on and, and did the, the most work with. Um, the first one that I really want to talk about is Azathoth. Azathoth is described as the idiot god who has flute music playing, which creates the universe. Um, he is a predecessor or ancestor of all the other gods, Naralhotep and yogg Shoggoth and all these other great names. Um, Lovecraft describes him as... Outside the ordered universe is an amorphous blight of nethermost confusion which blasphemes and bubbles at the center of all infinity, the boundless daemon sultan Azathoth, whose name no lips dare speak aloud, who gnaws hungrily in inconceivable unlighted chambers beyond time and space amidst the muffled maddening beating of vile drums and the thin mo monotonous whine of accursed flutes. <laughs> So that's a pretty visual image, right out of a nightmare. Um, now, uh, for uh, Lovecraft, it was very much just that. I mean, that's all he wrote about it, basically. He didn't go into a whole lot of detail beyond it. Uh, Donald Tyson has a book, which he calls The Grimoire of the Necronomicon. I'm going to put it up here so that people can see it. Um, it's an interesting book in that he, he constructs this whole battle between light and darkness and has the fall of a uh, figure called Barbel Zoa, which causes the insanity of Azathoth and the Twelve Dancing Gods and sort of equates Azathoth with the Demiurge from Gnosticism. So in, in Donald Tyson's rewriting of this mythology, there's, there's a structure there, and there's a fall, and that's why the god is crazy, and there's a chance the god might be redeemed when the female form is returned to the cosmic throne. But that isn't Lovecraft. Lovecraft's version was very bleak. It's just this idiot god out there beyond space and time. So, um, I... Uh, the next god that I really want to talk about is a uh, character by the name of Narl Hotep. Uh, Narl Hotep has some great names. He is called the Crawling Chaos, the Messenger of Azathoth, and the Nameless Mist. Uh, he basically runs around in the world and causes issues. Um, he, he destroys cultists. He destroys other people. He drives people mad. Uh, and he's used in a lot of stories because he's one of the most easily understood of Lovecraft's gods. He's basically this really, really powerful being that likes causing trouble. Um, and there's a lot of analogs there in other mythology, Hermes and Loki and, and all that kind of stuff. But 
this is has kind of a pseudo Egyptian name and kind of he comes out of this dark place like uh, most of his worshippers tend to be people from lands that uh, Lovecraft would have considered savage so it's kind of an interesting character for that uh, another big one that he talks about is Yog Shothoth uh, Yog Shothoth is the keeper of the gates and Lovecraft writes Yog Shothoth knows the gate Yog Shothoth is the gate Yog Shothoth is the key and the guardian of the gate past present future are all one in Yog Shothoth he knows where the old ones broke through of old and where they will break through again. He knows where they have trod Earth's fields and where they still tread them and why no one can behold them as they tread. Well, that'll look great on a business card. Exactly. <laughs> it's a nice little elevator speech is what I like to say. You know, he's, he's probably got the most worshippers. Um, he's a big figure in the Dunwich horror story where uh, there's a mad wizard who takes and summons Yog shagoth and has the deity breed with his daughter and he comes up with these two beings that aren't quite real. Uh, one of them is really mostly alien matter and then one of them is more human but still crazy. And so there's an interesting juxtaposition between these two children. Now he shows up um, in, he shows up in the Robert Anton, Anton Wilson's Illuminatus as well, right? I believe he does. Like I said, a lot of these creatures these creatures are public domain, so they show up in a lot of places with a lot of people. Uh, I'm sure Robert Anton Wilson talked about them. I don't remember my Illuminatus that well though. But uh, again you can kind of see this as something that occultists would latch onto, the guardian of the gate. So it's kind of a Cerebus function as well, this, this being that can uh, determine whether or not you get spiritual access or not. So that's, that's kind of the role yogg Shoroth plays in the, uh, in the mythology. Uh, and I want to talk about Yig. Yig is the father of serpents, and uh, as such has all those serpent qualities. He's got a certain amount of wisdom, but he's also kind of creepy and scary and and not really very fun to be around, apparently. And he also has a lot of worshippers from these areas that are hot and tropical and, and you know, places Lovecraft would have considered very um, uncivilized. He had a, uh, a big following among the Native Americans, according to the story that he shows up in. Um, next, Shubnigaroth, which is the black goat, or the goat with a thousand young, has sort of a hermaphroditic uh, feel to it, has worshippers that engage in ecstatic cultist behavior, um, is responsible for the creation and destruction of all sorts of, of amorphous creatures, and uh, is just this, this very ecstatic in like the, the Dionysian sense, this sort of creation through self-destruction possibility. Um, described as a hermaphroditic god and uh, has a Dionysian correspondence. So another big one in Lovecraft's mythology. Cthulhu, of course, is once uh, the dead and rising god that uh, waits until the stars are right and then comes to visit a second coming and bring a destruction to all the earth and eat everybody and has been, of course, just phenomenally taken over by the internet, by uh, uh, the gaming company, by plush toy makers, by all sorts of things. Um, he is depicted as having his own race of beings called the Cthulhu Spawn, who actually look kind of like little octopus men running around. And they're not completely made out of matter. They're some sort of alien race. And uh, they can only exist when the stars are right and all this kind of fun stuff. But uh, he's definitely a big one in the mythos and I think he's the one that August Derleth focused upon when he took over Lovecraft's estate and started the Cthulhu mythos. So there's that. Um, as a competing underwater god, there's also Dagon. And Dagon is the one who shows up in uh, a story called Dagon and also the Shadow over Innsmouth where uh, they're both... Dagon is, is sort of a Poseidonist 
figure, but he also has a chosen people, which is kind of interesting. <laughs> he has these people that uh, come to him, and in order to be, um, you know, saved when the end times come, when they clean off the planet, uh, they go and change themselves into these underwater beings and go back to the sea. And so they, they encounter a form of corruption. And I think for Lovecraft, you can definitely see the idea that religion is a corrupting influence rather than a, a helping one. He definitely puts it that way, that the worship of these gods is ancient and, and uh, leads to a degeneration of the human being. So those are the big ones that I wanted to talk about today. They, the reason I want to talk about them is because most people have heard of these. There are other ones. There's a frog god. There's a a bunch of other little deities and entities that could or could not be um, gods. Nobody's quite sure. Um, there are <coughs> gods that are created by other people that Lovecraft mentions. Um, Hastur the Unspeakable is one of them. You're not supposed to say his name. I don't know who came up with him. I think uh, August Derleth came up with him, and then Lovecraft mentions him in a story just kind of as a throwaway line. <clears throat> so there's a whole a whole series of these things, and one of the things that I read in the commentaries is that there wasn't any systematic thought to Lovecraft's ideas of this. Uh, it seems like most of his it, these came out of nightmares, and so there wasn't really a systematic theology, although he did send a letter to someone explaining where Azathoth was at the top, and then there were a bunch of descendants of him. Uh, Cthulhu was one, Yogg-Shogoth was a descendant of Azathoth and uh, Dagon. So some of these gods are supposedly related in the mythology. Hmm. Well, so e even if Lovecraft didn't have a, uh, a, a what what you might think of as a as a concrete system for all these things, uh, many people did take these uh, themes and try and put them into various systems, didn't they? Oh, yes. I mean, many people did and still are. Uh, there was a fellow by the name of Simon who wrote a Necronomicon back in probably the 80s, I think it was. I don't have the, the publication date. But he says that Lovecraft was depicting a struggle between light and darkness, and that this struggle is mirrored throughout all of history and all of religion, and there's Christian versions of it, but that Lovecraft was tapping into a uh, a Sumerian version of this myth, and that there were names in Sumerian like Cthulhu and Ag Azag Thoth and Ishnigarab, which is supposed to be Shubnigarath. And it's all completely made up. I mean, he totally was trying to, to shoehorn Lovecraft's ideas into something ancient to give it some sort of uh, uh, legitimacy. But yeah, probably there's, the most there's successful just grimoire ever. I'm sorry? Probably produced the most successful grimoire ever, available for nine yes. at Barnes & Noble. Yes, he did. And uh, like most grimoires, it's kind of unintelligible. <laughs> so it's it, it tries to systemize things and doesn't necessarily do a really good job. Um, another person who's really, really tried to systemize this these things is uh, Don... Donald Tyson, whose book I showed you earlier. I've got two of his books now because I started doing this and I was like, well, what are people doing with this? He takes and takes the traditional ceremonial magic correspondences with the planets and the zodiac and the, the idea of a one creator that's pretty much platonic, and he shoehorns all of, cre uh, of Lovecraft's creatures into it. So yogg is a is associated with uh, a planet and Mars and Azathoth with Saturn and, and all this kind of stuff. And he, he has sigils and he has elemental correspondences and zodiacal correspondences and spells and rituals and, and the idea, this is the biggest thing in here that, that differs from Lovecraft from my point of view, the idea that the, these entities are just trying to restore the world back to what it should be. I mean, that's very Gnostic idea mm -hmm. that, you know, the world has fallen and it should be an entirely different way and let's, let's get it back to that. And this is going to be painful and destructive and if you want to survive it, you have to um, 
kind of join with these spirits and, and find a way through the gates. And you can't do that if you're just matter. You have to become this spirit matter hybrid. And that's where the hybridization that is in so much of Lovecraft's stuff feeds into this. Mm -hmm. But again, completely made up. And the whole idea that these guys are in some way a, a good group or that Lovecraft thought that they in any way were concerned about humanity is definitely not in the original works. So, um, and then there's Lovecraft himself. I mean, we're going to talk about him a little bit. And we, there are people who argue that he had all this thought out and that he was actually an occultist and he's actually a mystic. And his own writings do not bear that out. He is very well read. He's very well versed in esoteric material, in antiquity, and in history. And so he would have known all of these stories, like uh, the stories of, of various gods and how they related. And he would have used them for his uh, for his gods as he's developing them in his nightmares. So I'm sure that was some of the source material. All right. Um, we only have a minute here, uh, but I would like to get into a little bit about why why are Gnostics so interested in this stuff? What's what's the appeal here? Well, I think that the horrors that Lovecraft was talking about um, showed an inner landscape of the man coming into the modern age. I mean, uh, the tension between the symbolic world of the archetypes that Jung was exploring versus the mechanistic and bleak reality presented that's, that science was presenting, that material humanism was talking about at the time, the Darwinism that was just devoid of all the myths that humanity had come up with throughout all these ages. And I think that there's a big conflict between humanity's desire for meaning and the realization that the world itself doesn't provide that meaning, that it's our interaction with it and our subconscious that comes into it. And so when you look at Lovecraft's creatures, he's expressing his desire for that meaning through the horror of not having it. Mm. Oh, that's uh, some interesting stuff, and I'm sure that we could spend hours and hours on it, but we're kind of up against our time here. So uh, thank you very much once again for joining us. We, we love having you thank on. Thank you so much. We'll do it again uh, soon. We're, we've got a third part of this uh, series that we'll, we will find a good time for, and we'll do it. Uh, tell everybody where they can find your stuff on the Internet. Uh, you can find me at 8th Sermon to the Dead, which is on Blogspot. Um, you can also find me on Facebook. All right, I will put those links in the show notes. Uh, if anybody who is watching this video has any comments or questions, you can leave them in the YouTube comments section, and we will uh, we will answer those as we get them. You can email us questions and comments at talknosis at gnosticnyc.com. Full show notes are available at talknosis.tumblr.com, and all the social media links will be in the description for this video. Uh, coming up at Gnostic NYC on August 11th, 10 a.m. at CRS in Manhattan, uh, 123 4th Avenue, we have the Buddha's Path to Freedom with John Aaron. It's a workshop. Uh, it'll be a three-hour uh, workshop. Uh, and then on August 19th, 2 p.m., also at CRS, The Secret Gateway with Ed Abdill, uh, former president of the Theosophical Society in America. If you have any questions or comments for that uh, lecture for Ed Abdill, you can please send them to us at info at GnosticNYC.com. And of course, you can visit GnosticNYC.com to see all the details on this and all upcoming Gnostic NYC programs. If you'd like to donate to support our mission and our, uh, our programs, please visit GnosticNYC.com. Down the left-hand side on the bottom, there's a blue button that says support us. Please click it, donate some money, and we will send you virtual hugs. And Talk Gnosis is a production of Gnostic NYC, promoting Gnosticism in New York City. Uh, you can find us online, again, at GnosticNYC.com. If you enjoyed this show, please share it with your friends, click the like button, and subscribe to our channel. Channel opinions expressed on this program do not necessarily represent the views of Gnostic NYC or of any other organization. No animals were harmed during the production of this show. For more Talk Gnosis, tune in every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. Have a good night.